Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel and Escape from the City on the ABC. And Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of the 2018 Property Investment Advisory Firm of the Year. All right, folks, you're on the property couch where each week Ben and I bring in the insider's guide to property finance and money management. Hello, mate. Huge show, mate. Is it huge? Huge, huge show. Is it? Huge. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. huge. Mate, huge. you're excited, aren't you? Oh, yeah. We're, we're There's an opportunity to um, to teach the community today Yep. something that's probably a, what's the right analogy here? It's just this um, underlying current for a few people that might have a question around, should I? Burningness in their guts, Bryce, Ooh. about should I sell or should I hold? It's there almost, will be people well, who are churning in the pits of their stomach and we're going to unpack we're gonna unpack it. The process, yep, and then a little sweetener on the end. Yeah, should I stay or should I go or should, should I, I sell stay or, or should, should I, I hold? Go now? Love it. Hey, uh, we brought in reinforcements. We have knock on the super excited capital growth lab door. Oh, and invite uh, Jeremy oh. Shepherd to join us today. Hello, mate. How Thanks, are you? Yes. Hi. Good. How are yeah, you? Yeah. First good. time in 2019, but oh. Welcome back. Why are we getting through some serious content today? So before we get the Ben Mindset yes. Minute, my wife is fully into Brene Brown. Okay. Uh, dare to lead, reading through the book, rattling all these things off of me. He sent me a little post um, that, sh- that Brene Brown put on Instagram. I thought it was good, Ben. Love it. You let me know what you think, all right? Sure. It's not fear that gets in the way of showing up. It's armour. It's the behaviours we use to self-protect. We can be afraid and brave at the same time. Oh, that is critical. But the armour suffocates courage and cages our hearts. The goal is to create spaces where arm, uh, where armour is neither necessary nor rewarded. And that was uh, hashtag Dare to Lead, which is her book. And um, Andrew's been going through that. But it's not the fear that gets in the way of showing up, Ben. It's the armour. It's the identity. It's the fact that if we just... And if you think about what we've been talking about in terms of people... Um, having conversations about money, mm-hmm. getting it out into the light. You know, we're all putting our armour on. We're saying, we should be right. We're okay, no problem. But if we get rid of the armour, the goal is to create a space where armour is neither necessary, having the conversations, or where we're saying, you know, that's good that you've kept that all to yourself. I love it. So there you go. But love um, the language. Let's get into today, mate. Uh, well, today we're going to talk about something that might be on a lot of listeners' minds. Certainly. Um, because, Ben, back in 2015, you and I said, oh, Sydney might have mm-hmm. reached that tipping point. Mm-hmm. It was. We were then proven that it went a little bit further. Yep. But what's happening now did, is... Did it's, some good, good yards. Yep. We so, didn't quite get that right. <laughs> but, but it's actually coming back to yeah, yeah, yeah. where those prices were at the time of that call, right? Yeah. So... For people who've been in the market for a long time, yes, this is an annoyance because they they just feel a little less wealthy. But for those people who got in at the sort of the FOMO stage mm-hmm. and are seeing the market come the other way, it, it it has genuine anxiety and concern for them. So today we want to talk to them directly about whether or not they should hold these assets. Yeah, look, it's a it's a bit of a backstory, right? Right. So I've been through six of these cycles mm-hmm. um, in the main capitals. And the the big one that this one reminded me of was the 2001 to 2003 mm-hmm. market where I was trying to buy something in Sydney and uh, property prices were going up crazy each weekend. It was just ridiculous. The amount of buyer activity that was out there and the frenzy buying activity for off the plan house and land packages. And I saw some images um, on TV about new apartment blocks being built and just crowds inside those sort of, you know, containers and the, the the sales rooms where dots are going up everywhere on different apartments. It was just frenzy, right? And I just knew at that point that um, just like in 2001 to 2003, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be burnt. Yep. Um, and so the, the situation from that has always been um, when you've bought a lemon, um, when you bought a dud, what do you do? Mm. Do you keep holding it? Or do you sell it? So I thought that's a great opportunity. It's a good question for Jez, isn't it? To ooh, bring ooh, Jez ooh. in. Yeah. Got my hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I can answer this one. I know this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, did you, you were, ever get caught in any frenzy markets on your journey? Did you? Or uh, yeah, I was usually at the uh, the good side of it, but yep. uh, there was uh, GFC hurt me quite a bit. Yep. Um, that. Uh, 
that sort of changed a lot of lending policy and uh, interest rates for me went up rather than down because I was I was borrowing from overseas, like a lot, a lot of the finance came from overseas. Yeah. And also I was doing contract work, um, had my own uh, ABN. So there were a lot of uh, issues that le- lenders did not like about me. Yeah. So refinancing was pretty ugly and quite often I had to had to sell as property prices came down. Yeah, uh, yeah so it wasn't pretty, but... Uh, yeah, but still, still. There's, there's a, I want to come back to that story. I think that's a good little starting point for having a conversation because there's some there's a real surprise, a big reveal yeah, at okay. the end of today's podcast. Mm. So what we wanted to do is there's two bits to today's. One is the, the fundamental bit around the numbers, mm-hmm. okay, and, and unpacking those numbers. There's a word we haven't used for a while. But I want to get back into unpacking the numbers. And then I want to talk, uh, I want us to talk about the emotional side. So the the human behaviour that we sometimes come up with. So to start off with, what we're we're going to be talking about is how do you know um, when it is right to sell or right to hold? So let's work through the logical steps, Jeremy, that you would go through in terms of that exercise. So the first thing we need to do is what? Okay, so... uh... The idea is is relatively simple. It's uh, the devil, of course, is in the detail. So, it's really a comparison of uh, I'm going to throw around a bit of terminology now. Uh, opportunity cost. So, opportunity cost is you got your money allocated in one asset, yep. but there's some other alternative asset somewhere else in the country that could be doing better than yours. And uh, all of us, all investors, except for one, over the next year, we're going to suffer an opportunity cost because there's one investment property over the next year that's going to beat all the others. Mm. So theoretically, every investor has an opportunity cost. The problem is, is it worthwhile changing your investment to an alternative uh, because there's a massive cost. Obviously, you've got to sell the property, you've got to pay capital gains tax, you've got to pay an agent, a commission, there's legal fees. And then buying another property, you've got stamp duty, you've got more legal fees, you've got all those inspections. So there's this huge cost to just recycle your equity. That's what it's called, recycling your equity. And that's really the cost to exit one market and enter uh, another one, which you believe has uh, a higher opportunity cost. So the, the tricky part is comparing your market with any other market and trying to estimate what that opportunity cost is and then come up with the numbers for your recycling cost. Obviously, if you're gonna miss out on more than what you will spend recycling, then you're probably better off uh, selling and buying elsewhere. If on the other hand, the recycling costs are too expensive and you're not missing out on that much, then you're better off holding. So for, a lo- sorry Bryce, for a lot of our listeners, there's some new terminology there. Yeah, yeah, that's where <laughs> I was gonna go. Alternative markets, recycled cost, opportunity cost. So the definition, of opportunity cost is, as Jeremy was you know, highlighting there, is if I've got $100 to invest and I invest that $100 into one item for a return, I've got no other chance of putting that money somewhere else while that $100 is there. The question is, if I had to put that $100 over here in, an, in another alternative, what would, would have been the difference of that? And so, well, my son had an opportunity cost that he had to encounter on the weekend because yeah, he was yeah. invited to two birthday parties, Ben. Yeah, there at it the is. At the same time, <laughs> and he had to weigh up which was the opportunity that he wanted to embrace, and which was the opportunity that. And, and sadly, Ben, he couldn't be in two places at How once. How many times have you been in that situation? Look, look, New Year's Eve's are one of the you know. Yeah. You know here we go off on a tangent. <laughs> New Year's Eve, you've got two or three parties to go to when you're yep. younger. Yep. And you're like, this party's just warming up. And you're like, I oh, know I've got to get. Yep. So you leave the best party usually to go to the next party. And you're thinking, and then you in your mind, it's like, back there. Oh, anyway, but with so that, it applies to investing cost, as well. Yep. It does. So that's the first one. But let, I want to I just put it into more basic terminology, uh, Jeremy. So when we talk about owning a property, what are the, what are the costs of acquiring a property? We've got... Stamp duty is the big one. Yep. So we've yeah. obviously got the value of the property that we're buying. So whatever that value is, then we've yeah. got stamp duty. Yeah. Then there's uh, inspections. So yep. building, pest inspections, yep. maybe a strata report. Um, and then, of course, you pay insurance straight away. There's um, legal uh, fees. Legal fees, yep. yeah. Conveyancing fees, That's those right. types of things. So they're the main ones, right? So, so if you're thinking about all of the costs to acquire a property, they form part of what technically is called the capital costs. Mm. So most of those are capital costs that we can that we can record. Um, if you paid lenders mortgage insurance, mm-hmm. then that yeah, isn't a capital cost. That one would 
uh, be written off over over five years. Mm. So so there is some tax consequences to those costs. A buyer's agency fee in most states of Australia yep. is a capital cost? Buyer's agency fee is a capital cost as well. Um, so that's the main acquisition cost. What about the ongoing costs? What else have we got there? Yeah, so obviously the big one there is uh, mortgage interest. Yep, a big <laughs> that's, interest that's bill. A killer. <laughs> yep. Yeah, then there's uh, management rates, uh, insurance, council rates, uh, repairs and maintenance. Um, gee, strata you know, fees. Strata fees, yeah, good yep. one. Yep. Yep. Insurances yeah. for yep, protecting the building, mm -hmm. those types of things. So there's quite a lot of those as well. And so you, we refer to them as the holding costs. Yeah, holding costs. Yeah, so, so once you understand you've got your initial acquisition costs, then you've got your holding costs, is there any other costs that we need to be aware of before we can get an indication of our existing property? Oh, gee, I think you've, you've uh, covered all of them, really. Okay. Yeah, I can't Good. think of any. Uh... Entry holding, and then now in the vernacular, Ben, recycle. Yeah, and you know, in terms of the management fees, we've also got property management fees. I don't mm -hmm. know where we mentioned yeah. those. Yeah. So we did, we got those. So, so that's all of our existing costs. So you can very simply put all of those down in a spreadsheet or in, in you know, sort of write them down and you can sum those numbers up. Mm. And you're going to get from that your acquisition, your original costs, and then also your holding or operating costs. Mm. Now, anyone who owns a, an okay investment property should be able to get a tenant in it. Mm -hmm. If you're not even able to get a tenant in there, that's, Oops. that's, yeah, that's problematic, problem. right? And, and unfortunately, even if you want to sell it, you may be in a situation where you can't get that. So what do we then look at, Jeremy, from an existing property in terms of the income that we get on the property, which is pretty straightforward, isn't it? Uh, you, you're talking about the uh, like holding costs versus your rental income. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so obviously you want to know how well your property is performing. If you're getting some uh, good rental income, your expenses are moderate, then uh, you, you may have a, a positively geared property where yep. you're actually getting more cash uh, each, each month. Uh, you may have a negatively geared property. Uh, you can claim that as a tax deduction currently. Yep. Who knows what's going to happen? Well, that's uh, grandfathered yeah. for now. So if you right, own yeah, that property, yeah, there, yeah. there's no there's no proposed change to that yet. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still an opportunity, Ben. Yes, it's still which an opportunity will be an opportunity cost. cost at some point. Yes. Yeah. Good point. <laughs> good segue. Okay. So so you've got these uh, ongoing costs and ongoing rental income, and that's sort of the performance, the ongoing performance of your property, in addition to whatever capital growth that it's getting right now. Yep. And I guess the idea of, well, should I hang on to this or, or sell comes down to uh, how's it going to perform in the future. And that's that's where it gets really tricky mm. because right now we can say, okay, I'm getting this much rent, getting this, uh, paying this much in expenses, but where is it heading next? If it's just flat for the next five years and it's negatively geared, uh, even if it's positively geared, but just at the rate of inflation, you're actually not getting anywhere. So uh, holding, a, holding a property with, say, 3% capital growth or less, a neutrally geared property is, is almost a waste of time for investors. So, so then the question is, um, people can then start, we, we talk about rental yields, we talk about capital gains. So in measuring capital gains and rental yields, rental yields is relatively easy. It's effectively the, the income that you're getting divided by the value of the property at times 100 over one. So you're getting a percentage of that rental yield. So if you're doing this exercise and you, you see a rental yield, a lot of people think that that rental yield is the most important thing on the page and mm. don't don't look at the capital growth. What's your view on rental versus capital oh, growth? Wow. Well, it's, it's astonishing what the difference can be. I mean, you have double digit capital growth uh, and contrast that to a property that is positively geared by 1%. I mean, you ask any Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide investor, how easy is it to get a property that is cash flow positive by 1%? And so you're, every year you're getting ahead by 1%. And then in one year, someone's got a negatively geared property, maybe it's cash flow negative by 1%, but they get double digit capital growth. And it's, it's all over in one year. The race is, the race is already won. Capital growth is the ants pants of property investing. There's, there's no better way to create wealth. But obviously you need the cash flow to stay in the game. Mm. So now we're starting to understand. So when, when a person who is not knee deep in this stuff like the three of us are every day, all of a sudden now I'm starting to see what my acquisition costs are, mm. what my ongoing holding costs are, what rental yield I've got and what capital growth I've enjoyed. Now, 
if I've held a property for say three or four years, right, and I've worked out my capital growth is at 2%, I'm effectively getting a return on inflation. That's mm-hmm. it, so I'm not making much money. So that should be a reasonable indicator that hopefully there's a better opportunity out there for you. But how do you test that? How do you validate mm-hmm. that story? And, and Jeremy alluded to it before, how you have to do that. And this is quite interesting, but you actually have to understand future capital growth potential as well as future rental yield growth to form the full formula to be able to work out your opportunity costs. So I think as we go into that stage, there is one other bit of work that needs to be done, isn't there? And that is what we call the recycle costs. So do you want to take us through those, Jeremy? Yeah, so re- recycling your equity is is moving it from one investment property to another, although it doesn't have to be uh, strictly just investment properties. Mm. Uh, no, you, could, another, uh, yeah. Yeah, yep. you could buy shares or whatever, but let's, let's assume that we are just property investors and we're just going to sell one property buy an, al- an alternative, a replacement. So that is recycling our equity. We sell up, we pay an agent a commission, we pay the ATO, the capital gains tax, pay legal fees, uh, and then we've got the sale proceeds. So the after-tax sale proceeds. We then use that as a deposit, pay stamp duty, more legal fees, uh, building pest inspections, all that sort of stuff to get into our replacement property. So we've now recycled our equity and there's been usually a pretty hefty cost. Um, it's usually capital gains tax that is the big, uh, well, if you should yeah. be so lucky. Uh, <laughs> capital, <laughs> capital gains tax should be your highest bill. Uh, yeah. You're doing something wrong if, if it isn't. And then it's stamp duty, which is one of the re-entry costs that's probably the next biggest. Then you've got the small ones like the inspections and the legal fees. For, for the context of this, the, yeah. the capital gains tax probably isn't the most expensive one because the people who have had a capital gain are probably not wondering whether they should sell or hold. It's the yeah. people that are well, uh, hopefully going to break there's, even. There's people like Jeremy out in this world who are gurus at this sort of stuff and take a trading view, though, Bryce, versus... A, sure. so, so if you found a market that you could make a killing in in five years, you've got a choice then too. So for a really sophisticated trader who wants to use residential property as that, they will do that calculation and they potentially would have a big capital gain of which they are happy to pay the government a percentage of because they're going to put their money to work elsewhere. But a lot of the people that we're going to be talking to... A bit, bit, bit of pressure on the next property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a bit of pressure. There is a bit of pressure in getting it right each mm. time. The other point to that, though, is that there's a lot of people out there right now who may have negative equity with off-the-plan apartments. And mm. So that calculation is actually a carried forward loss, Mm. um, which is going to offset future income. So I think once you do that calculation, um, you're gonna sort of have a bit of an idea in terms of what that looks like, so. Yeah, one of the benefits of not having a good property is that you don't have to pay capital gains tax when you offload it. So well, I always say, like right 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 yeah. <laughs> if I'm paying tax, normally it means I'm making yeah, money. Bring it on. Yeah. So, bring so it on. I always want to be in that situation. So, so, so let's go go back again. We've got we've got our acquisition costs, we've got our holding costs, our ongoing costs, and then if we decide that we want to sell that property, we've got our exit costs, which we talked about, and that forms part of the recycle costs. So. From there, you then have a pool of money, don't you? Because in some cases, let's go through an example where you may have burnt some some cash. So they, you bought a five hundred thousand dollar property, okay, and it hasn't off the plan. And let's say it valued up at four hundred and fifty, and you're not happy with that, so mm. you, you decide to sell it and you sell that for four hundred and fifty. So take people through. Really, what we're talking about is what what equity they've got left over that they can then reinvest. Yeah, so if it was a $500,000 property, and let's assume they had an 80% loan to value ratio, which is which is quite common, so they would have had to come up with 100,000, they mm-hmm. borrowed 400,000, but now you're saying the property's come down, it's slid, it's now only worth 450,000. So at the sale, should they choose to, uh, to sell, they're going to get uh, a cheque for $450,000. They've got to pay back their lender the $400,000. Mm-hmm. That leaves them with $50,000. They've got to pay the agent a commission. Let's say that's 2% of $450,000. So let's say it's uh, nine, grand. That's a nine grand. So they're now down to uh, $41,000. Uh, there's legal fees will come out of that. Um, maybe they had to clean up the uh, the 
uh, unit uh, before they sold it. So they really don't have uh, a lot from that that hundred thousand deposit they they started off with. They they have lost more than half of that. And, and they, let's be honest, more than a hundred to get it in the first place because you yeah, got stamp, stamp duty, but very yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the five hundred with five percent acquisition cost is five twenty. Mm. So you are. It's about that one hundred mm. to one twenty. So mm. all of a sudden now they've got less money. They m might still have the same borrowing capacity, but they're going to have to. to mm. If they want to compare apples with apples, it's what what they can actually buy with that money left over. Like if they've got no other money to contribute to that alternate purchase. Yeah, it really narrows down their, their it, alternatives. It's, it's potentially, yeah. gonna, and so that then also becomes, well, if that's if that's the only market that you can play in, then that's gonna potentially limit. And you've gotta get maybe even a slightly superior return on that because it's less of a value of the other in terms of, you know, like mm. if, if, the, if the recycled property, uh, the alternate property in the alternate market is Oh, sorry, the replacement property in the alternate market is um, lower at 400 versus the, the current property you're holding at 500 and you've both got predictions for both. Yeah, yeah. When does that line cross over? Yeah. When, do you, when, when are you in a better financial position to justify that expense? So we know this is hard, listeners. We, we know that this is not an easy thing to do, but the reality is it's, it's far worse so it's far better to exercise this demon and sleep at night instead of just sitting on a dud property and just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for years. In fact, there was a story in our office only this week where we had a situation where someone had been holding a property for 13 years. They paid $330,000 for this property and the market had valued it at 380, but they couldn't get that price. So they're now down at 350. Mm. Now, 13, 13 years. years. Now, that's in a suburb and in a market that's done far better than that particular property has done. It's, it's obviously an apartment in a complex. Mm. And so that's why it has its own economy in terms of interest of buyer. So that's a perfect example. So if that person had have done this exercise maybe four or five years ago and worked out that they were getting less than 1% capital growth return, from that point of view alone, they probably would have thought, well, that's not even getting me inflation and I, they would have pulled the trigger earlier. Can't get those 13 years back. Can't get those 13 years back. So we've now got a situation where we've been able to look at all of those costs. We've now looked at the recycle costs. And as you've just explained, Jeremy, there's a, there's a pool of money left over. So yeah. we've got the pool of money, the proceeds of that sale, that, that, that remaining amount of money. Now we've got a choice to top that up. Okay, so if we've got borrowing power back up to that 500 level. And if we have got some equity somewhere else, we can potentially top that up and try and look for a property in a higher market if we feel that that's gonna give us a better opportunity. Yeah. Or, or we've got to go- higher, higher loan to value ratio. Yeah. So maybe their, their cash flow is improved in that period of time and they could get a 90% loan to value ratio. So their, their deposit of, let's say, uh, 35,000, you know, it's still cheaper, but, um, uh, you've got to pay stamp duty. So yeah, their options are really limited there. In that specific case, it is going to be very difficult for them to find uh, an alternative market somewhere in Australia in, in a price range that they can afford, even at a 90% loan evaluation. Yeah, because it changes to P&I too, right? In terms of the lending. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, unless, like you said, Ben, they bring in some extra equity from somewhere else. Yep. Maybe they sell some shares. Uh, they have a garage sale or something. Or like they that. have some equity in an existing property, which, yeah. they, you know, which they can do. So. And that's why a lot of people think that it is, is it is just as simple as saying $500,000 property here versus $500,000 property, $500, property there. If you can't re-execute on that future $500,000 property, then you're not comparing the right story. Hmm. You're not comparing apples with apples. It still may be that you've got a dud property and you might need to exercise your demons and get out of that and take that money and, and proceed somewhere else. But the, the fundamental thing with property is it's, it's very much a leverage game. Like, you know, the, the reason why we like to leverage into property is because of the low volatility that we see in the property space as opposed to doing that with other assets. Well, the recycle costs. And the recycle, yeah, and that, that's that illiquidity that we've talked about. I mean, there's liquidity if you've got equity and you've got access to borrowings, but there's none if you've got none of those things. So, I mean, you know, this is a pretty technical podcast that mm. we're putting here together today, but we wanted to make a deep dive into this stuff because there would be, without a word of a lie, I would believe there'd be over 100,000, if not more, of the current properties that are in people's portfolio where this 
conversation needs to be had. Mm. 2.5 million or 2.35 million properties out there for investment purposes, the number's probably even higher than that. You know, you're probably talking quarter of a million properties where people are just sitting back going, do I wait? Mm. Do I wait for that to go? Mm. So I, I want to circle back to, you know, the work we've done. So, so Bryce, why do you think it is that, that the emotion gets involved in people being, being impatient or patient or trying to throw good money at bad? Well, circle back to some of the other podcasts that we've had about the conversation of, around money being in the dark and trying to shine some light mm. on it. People would have um, various levels of self-esteem tied into the decision that they've yep. made, right? So if they've made a dud, admitting that is, is it can be difficult, right? So sometimes no news is good news or n- not knowing is better than knowing. Well, and if one party in a, in a household has led that charge mm. to he- admit... Yeah. defeat yep. to your other, yeah. that's that's the hard one, right? I mean, I, I use the analogy because... Well, we, I used to work at the casino, Ben. Yeah, go. And I saw it so many times where people said, oh, you know, I've lost what I came with. I'm just going to stick around until I get it back. Yeah. And and it's it's that it's, it's almost that mentality that creeps when in. When the odds are against you. Yeah, based on what you just said, the person yeah. who's gone out there and yeah. made a bold decision and put the family into this scenario... Yeah. Um, they, they, they'd be inclined to say, well, let's just keep going until she comes back. Um, it's proudness. It's admitting mm. that defeat, isn't it? That, sorry, honey. Um, yep, uh, I thought property investing would be a good thing for us, but it's not going to be a good thing. And we see it in the review work that we do when we're building plans. So not only do we obviously... Okay, many of those conversations. Many of those conversations. Mm. And, and it is a difficult conversation because we run the data sets we show the insights. We we, sh- we clearly show that it hasn't performed. Uh, we use Jeremy's DSR uh, algorithm to look at forward projections of what the capital growth estimates are going to be. And if it's just dead in the water, oh my God, they are difficult conversations. And I know we talk about it in the team. Uh, the best analogy I can do is this, Bryce. You know when you've got a hairy hand mm-hmm. and you put a band aid on it. Mm. And you know when you're going to pull it off, Mm. it's going to take a bit of the hair and obviously that's going to really hurt. It's going to hurt the skin. This analogy is worse. You've got super glue under that bandage, right? So because it's a big amount of money, pulling that that bandage off is going to take a lot of skin with it, right? Mm. So you're going to hemorrhage a little bit of blood. Mm -hmm. So you need to have... Wow, mate, this is graphic. You need to have a cloth and hold. <laughs> you need to hold that on because yeah. that's going to hurt for a while. Yeah. Right. As opposed to if you rip it off quick, people don't do that. Do I'm that. I'm impressed they, with that analogy. Yeah, did you? Yeah, you got well, on the spot, or you've well, been thinking about that? No. Well, what happened was um, the guys came to me and said, "How do I explain this to a client?" Mm. And I said, "Well, the best way I describe it is, yeah, yeah you've got to basically you've got to tear it off, and you're going to tear a lot of skin. Mm-hmm. It's going to hurt, mm-hmm. right? But." It's, you're giving them the right advice. Collingwood supporter is used to a lot of pain, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, have you got any other emotional reasons why people don't sell? Um, well, I think that a lot of people, uh, like you said, you hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's, it's confronting, you're admitting defeat, and it takes a lot of courage to, to, to call that. But people lack the, the confidence of knowing. They're still thinking, well, maybe this market is, is about to kick off. So there's, there's that glimmer of hope which just keeps them holding on to a dud asset. And, uh, and it can, like you said, in that case, we're at 13 years, which is extraordinary. Yeah, um, yeah if, you have, if you've purchased the wrong asset and got the timing all wrong too, it could be, uh, and the location wrong too, it could be decades. Uh, so it's, it's a, the glimmer of hope is, is keeping, them, keeping them in the market mm. when they should be, like you said, ripping that bandage off and, and well, moving on. Uh, we, we talked about this before around people, even when they do sell for a small gain, they go, oh, yeah, I hold it for three years and it went up from 300000 to three hundred and sixty. So how much debt did you have against that property? Oh, about two eighty, dollars all right. So what, what interest are you? About, about uh, maybe 15, 20 grand a year I paid. Oh, that's 60 grand. So did you make any money? What? And they go, oh, oh, no. you're right. Yeah, no. you're right. It's amazing how many people who don't factor in the interest holding cost, mm. being the biggest cost that we talked about earlier, and they just think, oh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in front. I don't know whether you are. So it, it really is a big decision. Now, Bryce, we are on record verbatim in terms of we're long-term investors, right? Mm-hmm. We, we buy, hold, we look for dirt that we think is going to be worth, 
you know, worth a lot more money over time and we want that asset on top of the improvements on top of that dirt to basically also have some type of appeal around, you know, some, some uniqueness with it. So it gets the emotional buyer and when we potentially get a above area gain over time. So th that's always been our piece. But when you have bought into something of this nature and you are in a run of a mill environment where there is literally no demand and a huge amount of supply, um, this is going to be a way in which you can work out how to do that. So I think from that point of view, it's, it's a really um, important, important point because emotionally you, you've tried to take control. You've tried to allow yourself the decision that is, I'm gonna take the family to a better financial situation. But unfortunately through lack of research, lack of understanding, I haven't taken them to that location. But because it can build up some some jealousy from seeing because you know I, I remember talking to some friends over in Perth where um, it was over Christmas maybe four or five years ago. Yep. And they'd seen what some, they were emulating what someone else had done. And so, but I, I was there because I'd, I'd spoken to a mate. I'd helped him buy a yep. property. Yep. All the fundamentals that we talked about on, on the podcast. But this particular person didn't pl place any sort of um, credibility around the fact that I'd been doing it for a little while. And they said, no, we, we're buying brand new stock because the person we bought off has got 13 of them, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore it must be going really well and it must be working. And it's like, well, um, but then when they, and they bought some and it's gone mm -hmm. south, right? Yeah, so, but then, but then what it does is it builds up some, some jealousy and some envy around, okay, well, it feels frustrating that I, or I thought all I needed to do was put my name on a title, you know, isn't yep. that what the, what the seminar guys tell you, put your name in the title and wait for the time to yeah. do the rest of the work. So it can build up that that, that angst if internally. It, if anyone who sells high rise or off the plan um, house and land packages tells you that they've got five or six of them themselves or even 10 or 15 of them, here's what I want you to do. Verify it. I want you to give <laughs> me the address of each of those properties and I want you to tell me what you paid for them. Mm. And I'm going to check that against the RP data or even real estate, most of the sales history records are all in most of the portals now. And I'm going to marry up against that. And then we've just taught you how to do your capital gains growth figure over an annualized period. So whack that into your formula and see how well they've gone against the broader market. In a lot of cases, the reason why these people have that portfolio is because they're in bed with a developer mm. and they're making big commissions. Well, I can tell you from personal experience, Ben, I've written it in the book, we've said on the podcast, I was on that side of the fence yep. early days. A lot of the people who get those commissions, they rebate it off what they pay at settlement. So there they may go. only have to do five or six transactions to help other people. And then it is a no brainer for them because yeah. Jeremy said it before, the biggest expense you have is mortgage interest. Well, if you're, if you're um, securing an asset for $400,000 and your loan on it is 150, uh, let's be honest, that's a, that's a pretty positive outcome in terms of cash flow for that person. So, and then it tells um, from the, in, you know, we talk about this being the insider's guide, what that does is it allows that person to go, I'm buying one in the same development. Yeah, I'm buying. Well, there's social proof right there. If you're buying one, I should buy one. Um, but the reality is, they're not competing on a level playing field. Yeah. And and you know the other emotional challenge you've got there, Jeremy, is really around this whole idea of not knowing what the future holds. So, talk to us more about what why that holds people back from making this sort of big decision. Yeah, well, I guess uh, they're thinking to themselves. Uh, fair enough, I don't, I don't know where this property is going, but I, it could actually turn the corner or it, or it could go uh, further south. And so not knowing, they're, they're stuck where they are. Um, there's, there's arguments for selling because of the past performance being poor, but then there's arguments for hanging in there and, uh, and waiting for that, that period of time when, when the market does eventually rocket upwards. And if you have enough patience, you probably will get to see a lot of that capital growth. But uh, is it going to be in the next few years or is it going to be in the next 13 years? And I think that when you rip that bandage off, you've made a, a, a courageous decision to, to learn something. You learn from your mistakes. You think, all right, well, what did I do wrong? You've accepted that it's a mistake and so you can learn from it. If you, if you have to wait 20 years before you can put your hand up and say, all right, I made a mistake, mm. then you get maybe two learning experiences before it's game over. Whereas if you can put your hand up after just three years, 
then within you know a, a dozen years, you've learnt uh, learnt from a lot of mistakes, and you've got still some time left over to make amends. I mean, there is that time heals all wounds, is that saying? Mm. And they do. They put their head in the sand and they just let it go. I think Jeremy makes a really good point, Ben, because if you you can you can get a um, a medical degree, you can get yeah. an MBA, you can get all sorts of qualifications that put you into all sorts of student loans and lots yeah. of debt. That so people. People pay tuition fees to learn, which is a positive thing, yep. so they can eventually earn their yep. income. Got it. But you know, Jeremy's just saying, well, it's a tuition. It's a it's a yeah. it's a university passage, of life passage, fee. Rite of passage. Um, don't make it a twenty year fee. Make it a yep. you know uh, that analogy you talked about. Just let's 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 crystallise it now and have a look at what other opportunities you've got, provided you can leverage into something else. Mm. So I, I think there's some some great lessons there in terms of being back in control. Because if you don't get back in control. You, you, you do. You only have two shots at this. So the question here, guys, is what can be done about it? Mm, you yeah. Know, I mean, there's probably a lot of listeners in there going, this is me. Or, this is, or everyone would know someone who's holding a dud, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, what can be done about that? Well, I want to circle back to the original story. So, so Jeremy, you know, we had a chat about this a uh, couple of years ago mm -hmm. uh, when you came and said, and it was probably on the back of your story about the GFC before where you had to make some of those decisions. And what were the things that you were looking for to work out which were the right properties to sell and which weren't? Yeah, uh, a good question because, you know, when I was uh, learning about property investing, every expert of the day told me, you buy and never sell. And I think that's, that's good advice if you've got the right property to begin with. But uh, there are definitely times to sell. I mean life circumstances can change. So how do you determine which one to, to offload? And uh, obviously, if, if cash flow is an issue, you might be thinking, all right, this, is, this one's the most negatively geared property, I'm going to get rid of that and maybe replace it with a positively geared property. But what if that is the one that's set to boom over the next couple of years? You, mm. could, you could have like 30% capital gain in that period of time. Um, so it, it gets really complicated. The two things you've, you've got to look at, well, there's actually three things. You've got to put together capital growth forecast. You've got to have a rent forecast and expenses. So you know that you, you balance your expenses against your rent, whether it's a loss or a gain, uh, it's a certain figure. And then you've got to somehow be able to forecast over the uh, next few years, how much is this property going to grow? And then you're comparing that to an alternative and of course the cost to move your money into that alternative. Now in that example you gave where it, uh, it was an off the, pl off the plan purchase, mm -hmm. yep. so they've gone down from 500 to 450 and we realised if they sell, they're not really going to have much money left over. So they're probably not going to be able to get back in the market. But is it still worthwhile hanging on to that thing? If it's cash flow positive, well yeah, that's, that's fine. Mm. If there's forecasts though for negative growth, then they could be worse off. It could be 400,000, not 450 in a few years' time. So there still needs to be some estimate of the future capital growth, and that is absolutely crucial for determining whether to offload or not. Because it's an important point you make, because it's a little bit of crystal balling, right? Whereas the accountant is going, the accountant's recommendation is going to be a tax outcome recommendation rather than a what Correct. is the next best move for your mm, portfolio. Yeah. So. That but they makes only what make you're that, saying even harder to juggle. They only make that tax recommendation because they don't know What's the going, future yeah. with the property as well. So they're sort of saying, well, th what I, from what I do know, I'll make the recommendation around the tax piece. So from that, um, you know, when we first started working together and started building research tools for residential Australian investment, you came up with this great idea to build a platform where you can work out how to sell or hold a property. Yeah, well, we were doing it so many times, weren't we? So many, so many clients would come in, and we just don't know how. How do we answer this this question? And it's it's on so many investors' minds. So, yeah, it seemed logical to let's break this down, think about it objectively, and uh, let's do as many calcs as we can. Is it possible to uh, to come up with something, a, a system that will work consistently for for every every property? So on that, Jeremy, in terms of building a platform, which, which is called Sell or Hold, by the way, um, sellorhold.com.au, in building that platform, um, was there any reservations around, clearly you can articulate the cost to acquire, the cost to hold, the cost to mm. recycle, 
but needing to make a um, uh, a recommendation or a I guess give give guidance to what's going to happen in the future. Was there any reservations around that being sort of crystal balling rather than black and white facts? Yeah, well, obviously one of the most important aspects is is trying to forecast capital growth. Mm -hmm. And although it's a lot easier to uh, estimate, you know, your exit costs. Are oh, you going to pay an agent this much commission? They usually charge this much. The ATO is going to charge you that much. You know, those are uh, more calculations rather than forecasts. But the capital growth is is one of the hardest things to forecast. And uh, by this stage, we've had this uh, demand to supply ratio running for quite a few years, and we're able to look at the history of that and see how markets have performed with that certain demand to supply ratio. And there's, there are some, some inconsistencies. Some markets, events take place and you just, you can't, uh, you can't, you know, it, there's still a risk with investing. But what we were getting at was uh, a capital growth forecast was possible to be made from a demand to supply ratio. So as you know, prices go up when demand exceeds supply. So if you've got a, a good indicator, a good gauge of the demand and supply in a property market, you've actually got a, a good capital growth forecasting tool. And that's what the, the fundamentals of this platform are based on. So, the, I mean, the foundation of anxiety is not knowing, right? So you've given a process, you show through that process, and then you actually say, well, from the basis of having that history uh, in, in the tools that you've developed in the past, it allowed you to get some confidence around providing the guidance to the user to say, okay, should I sell or hold on this particular mm. asset? Yeah, actually, a good choice of words, some confidence, because there, there are no absolutes. There's no 100%. This, this algorithm uh, is not perfect. And so what we do in this, in this platform is give uh, like a, a confidence range. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the, the optimistic and, and pessimistic range. And so it's when we can uh, forecast with this uh, approximate confidence that, uh, that we can provide more insights. So previously, uh, a property owner, investor, would have no idea. Mm -hmm. And although this system isn't 100% perfect, at least it's giving them an idea. And this is the, the key to the platform. What it delivers is a whole bunch of insights about their property, their cash flow, their expenses, uh, a forecast of capital growth, optimistic case, pessimistic case. So it's really just equipping them with insights so they can make the final decision. But it's, it's never a black and white case. It's, not a, it's never 100%. There's always going to be a risk in investing. Correct. And no, no investment tool or predictions or forecasts or anything will ever do that. Um, but I tell you what, so many people out there are flying blind mm -hmm. and they're making irrational decisions or worse still, no decision at all. Yeah. So mm -hmm. being able to provide them with a series of powerful insights to be able to sort of help them make an informed decision Knowledge is power, right? We keep talking about this all the time. And, and this is all about the, these data insights uh, using very sophisticated work that Jeremy's been working on. It's been his life work in terms of this great work uh, from Jez. So our, our goal is to now allow people to be able to use that. So can you just quickly take us through what it does and effectively how it works? All right, so um, first of all, you, you need to create an account, but um, all you're doing is you're putting in your property's details. So the system asks all the relevant questions. Um, so and those questions that we were talking about yeah, earlier? Yeah, yeah, your rental income, yep. expenses, how much you're paying, and how much you bought the property for, what it's worth now, uh, how, how big is your loan, and it, it goes through and figures out if you were to sell, here's how much money you'd have left over. And that money could be directed towards stamp duty deposit for an alternative purchase. Then it scans the country looking for property markets that are in that target price range. And it assesses those alternative markets for their capital growth potential, mm -hmm. assesses your current market for capital growth potential, does all the numbers and figures out would you actually be better off biting the bullet and buying elsewhere and by how much. And it comes down to like a dollar figure. So the system is, isn't a long-term forecaster of capital growth. Yep. And uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do is have the investor in a better position within a short period of time. If there is very little difference between their current investment property and an alternative that they could replace it with, 
uh, then it, it might take a long time for that difference to, to evolve. When it's that tight, we, just, we would prefer to just say, take it easy, hold, it's too risky, why would you go to the trouble? But if after a very short period of time, like three years, you can be in a significantly better position, then that just lends a lot more weight to the argument that you should rip the bandage off, sell, and buy elsewhere. So we use three years for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, it's much easier to forecast capital growth over that period for both the current property and it, all of the alternatives, potential alternatives. And secondly, we want to see the investor in a much better position sooner rather than, than later. Mm. Mm. Mate, again, it's an incredible bit of work. Bryce, you wanted to say something? Uh, mate, obviously you've put a lot of time and energy into it. And for, uh, for some people, some of the concepts we've talked about today are new to them. So there's a few things they can do. If they go to uh, sellerhold.com.au, there's a f uh, they can go and check out a few demo videos. So you'll be able to check, uh, have a look under the bonnet and see if um, see what you've been talking about. And equally, they can they can get a sample report. They just go. It's a free sample report available on the homepage. So all you do is land on there, put your email address. We'll email that uh, sample report to you, um, so you can check it out. Because uh, I think um, for a lot of people, Ben, they may not have thought about it, um, but at least this can open the discussion, start the conversation, allow the stakeholders to talk about this before they sort of get into a panic move. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I'm really proud of too, Bryce, is, I mean, obviously Jeremy's work here over the last couple of years has just been extraordinary, mm -hmm. really phenomenal work. But we made it a conscious choice also to allow people to set up a free account. Mm -hmm. um, so they can put as many properties in there, in their account as they want to, and they can do the preliminary assessment of their existing property early. So all of what we were talking about before in terms of the acquisition costs, holding costs, the performances, the yields and all that, that's all free. And it's really simple in terms of being able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it is very simple now. So I guess, um, Ben, what we've always done is is try to provide our community um, with resources and opportunities to help them make better um, yep. decisions. You, you mentioned that there is a cost, but uh, as always, we, we want to make sure that the, the Property Couch listeners get an opportunity to get a always, discount. Always, Bryce. So we always, in anything that we launch, 20% off. Yep. 20% right? off for this effectively groundbreaking bit of technology and software and the data is insane of what you're about to see. So, but it's only for the first four weeks. So it's an introductory 20% off. So, okay. so make no mistake, it's free it's to set up, here, free to set up an account and then you can get inside. But when you click on the seller hold report, it'll take you through into the area and then there's a discount code there for 20%. And that opens up all the alternative markets where they can do unlimited reports as long as they can analyze up and down in terms of higher values, lower values. So they really are making an informed decision. What we didn't want to do is charge per report. Mm. We wanted to say, this is the data point, this is the data set, and you can come back in tomorrow, the next day, the day after, a year later. Now you're still running with that month's data though. If you do want to get future data sets, then you will have to pay again. Yeah, you have to refresh that. So, all right, well, uh, there's a theme there, Ivers. 20% for the book, 20% for location score, now 20% for seller hold, which is really, really good. Yeah, well, can I just say that, you know, this is not a simple uh, piece of software, and we knew that people were going to struggle with this. So there is an enormous amount of online help. Mm -hmm. There are tutorials, there are information icons all over the website that you can uh, click on to get more context-sensitive help. There's these uh, case studies, frequently asked questions. That we've gone to a lot of trouble uh, with the help. But of course, if you do have any problems, yeah, just uh, send us an email at info at sellerhold.com.au. Well done, mate. It's uh, obviously something that uh, you've been passionate about. It's born from an experience that you had in your own portfolio. Um, you are paying it forward so that you hope that other people don't have to get into the same situation that you found yourself in. So a couple of things, well done. Thanks for coming Thank in you. and uh, sharing some of that technical stuff that comes with um, uh, the decision that people make. And uh, clearly, uh, we hope that uh, all the listeners, if you're someone who can relate to anything we said today, go and download a sample report or f do the free account. If you're someone who's curious about property, go and check it out. Or Ben, if you're actually flying along uh -huh. and you still want to uh, sample and see any what if scenarios, feel free, you're able to go and have a look at Seller Hold. So there's an opportunity really for everyone to get some benefit and some value out of that. Mate, it's been great to have you back in uh, on the couch. Um, keep up the good work. Looking um, forward to getting you in in a couple, well, probably about a month once we get the Feb data through the system and you can give us an update on the market. All right, yeah. Around the grounds. Glad to. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, Ben, 
I'm continuing uh, my life hack around money hacks. Sure. I, s- I said uh, early on yes. that I'm on a mission to make sure all of our listeners uh, do the seven day float, Ben. Love it. So I'm going to give you another reason why you should have a seven day float, Ben. Because it stops slippage spending. Now we've talked about this a couple of times, Ben, but I want to make sure that the person who just text messaged me realised they just made it to the podcast. <laughs> Congratulations that- <laughs> on coming on the show, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Brad K, because <laughs> he does listen, so he'll know that it was him. Um, it uh, it stops the slippage spending. Now, i got to say, Ben, we've talked about this in the podcast, that so people go, oh, come on, we'll be there. Yeah. This is important. In fact, I think this is the biggest enemy of household budgets because I don't know too many people. You tell me if you know any different. Even you, Ivis, if you want to speak up, although we know that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, how many people have you come home uh, that have told you, gee whiz, I went down the shops last night and I bought a big purchase without planning for it? They don't. No. They generally, some people do, right? But generally mm. speaking, people don't. But how many people have stopped off and they've tapped and go, and then you ask them, what were the last, okay, you've just done a tap and go, but be, tell me about the last two tap and goes before that. What was that for? And they go, don't know. Don't know. Don't know. Was so, it? Yep. Was so, it critical for your survival? <laughs> if you've only Probably got tw- not. Ben, if you've only got 20 bucks left in your seven day float, yes. I can assure you as a human being, you will get creative. For as long as you shuffle in your seat, when you get uncomfortable to find a better position, you will do the same with your money. Yes. And you will make sure that that 20 bucks, that lobster, yep. you don't have a pineapple, yep. you've got a lobster, you'll make it last until the next replenishment of the seven day float. Ben, have I, have I, have I made a case for a seven day float in the last few weeks? If not, stop slippage spending is the reason you should do well, it. Well, we've talked about this also before, Bryce, but if I told you you had $10,000 to live for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. How protective of every dollar are you going to be in your spending? Oh, I would make every post a winner. You would be very careful. Into, that's it. No more is coming your way. Mm-hmm. You've got $10,000 left to live for the rest. You start to change your behaviour. So if you have that, if you tell yourself that story that every dollar has a job to do and I didn't originally have that dollar planned for that job, then I wouldn't do it. Yeah, I like it, Ben. Mm. So very, very good. So there you go, folks. Three in, four to go. Uh, maybe I'll double check those on my four in, three to go. One of those, Ben. <laughs> One of those is true. But I'm on a mission to get everyone on a seven-day float. Beautiful. Did you know? Did you know, Bryce? So I'm back in my little book here of factfulness. Right. By Dr. Hans Rosling. Yeah. And I'm talking about plane crashes. Oh, gosh. So, right. yes, a little bit of data for you. So I've got a little... Is that because you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is a bit like jumping off the cliff and assembling the plane on the way down? <laughs> I don't know. I, maybe it's because I've become over the... I mean, I've probably had a few flights in my life. Yeah. I haven't become... I'm, I'm less of a comfortable traveller on a plane these days. I don't you're know what less it is. of a comfortable traveller. Yeah, I used to not worry about it. Now when the thing starts bouncing around a bit... Yeah. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just my age or whatever. But well, I, you I'm, got in before me. Yeah. I was going to say, middle-aged <laughs> man like you should uh, be a bit more worried about that. But I draw stuff. some strength from this stat right here, right now, as I hold my preacher's book up. <laughs> and here it is, plane crashes. So annual deaths per 10 million, 10 million passenger miles by commercial airlines and this is a five-year average. All right. So I'll say that again. Yeah. So so for every ten billion passenger miles travelled by was commercial it, was aircraft, it million before, wasn't it? Billion? No, okay. this is billion. Okay. Ten billion passenger. Sorry, that's why I went there again because <laughs> I'm I'm dyslexic. Yeah. Um, commercial airline, and this is the average over five years. So in 1929 to 1933, how many passenger deaths did we experience on commercial aircraft? Not in wars but in commercial aircraft travel. Gosh, I have to work out if the Wright brothers had actually done the flight by then. You've got to remember these things used to drop out the sky, right? They yeah. weren't, they were built out of steel and steel doesn't, yeah. you know, bend well or... Men, Can you, you give know. me like a hint? Like that's it's, a in, it's in the thousands, not in the tens of thousands, okay. but it's in the thousands. All right, I'll give you a, uh, what period? Four years? Yeah, four years from 1929 to 1933. All right, I'll give you 1,100. Oh, okay. So no, 2,100 yeah. deaths mm-hmm. per 10 billion passenger miles. Okay. Now, from 2012 yep. to 2016, right. how many passenger deaths for every 10 billion passenger miles travelled? So we're going from 2,100 to... to uh, wow, total stab in the dark. Uh, uh, 700. 
700? Yeah. One. This is how good we've got with commercial travel, aircraft travel. So it works out for every one. 10 billion passenger miles, we average one death. That's pretty good, isn't it? It's not bad. Yeah. It says to me that those plans are taken off and landing. That graph's going in the right way. A lot, of, <laughs> as they always would, in fact, put us. So yeah, we've vastly improved the safety of air travel to a point where I'm looking at that when I was reading, I'm like, whoa, that's insane. That's amazing. So, and so obviously there are a huge amount of more commercial aircraft traveling in the sky. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, I don't know how many planes are up in the sky at any one time, but it would be in the thousands. Mm -hmm. And so the 10 billion passenger miles are getting up pretty quick. So when you think about that, only one passenger dies. The best thing for me for flying, Ben, I've got to say, yes. is um, you know this, but the audience don't know this. That, um, I got 13 hours into my pilot's license, Ben. Yes, you did. And once I understood uh, the principles of flight, um, now I understand how such a humongous <laughs> structure can actually stay up in the air, um, given that my first flying instructor was a 21 year old. Wow. And I. I was in my like, sort of mid twenties. Yeah, it's, it's matrices, isn't it? Isn't that the maths that they use to work out mm. elevation and lift and all of that stuff? Yep. Stalling. I know stalling is yeah, on a plane now. Very so, good. There you go. Well, yeah. well done. So I did not know that. That ben. was an incredible I like, stat. So I like where the graph was going on we're that. We're getting better. We're getting better at flying in the sky. Well, Ben, um, it's come to that point in the podcast yep. where I ask you um, whether or not there's anything you'd like to sign off with. Is there anything you'd like to say? At the moment, yes. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on it. Well said. First time I've heard that. I love it. See you next week, folks. Folks, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Just a quick reminder that this is general advice only, and you should always consult a professional advisor before making any investment decisions. And if you haven't had the chance to go back to the foundational episodes, we've got good news for you. Go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and check out the free binge guide, which gives you the insights you need from the first 20 episodes where we unpack the foundational pillars of the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. It's completely free and available now.